open up a 20 minute panel for discussion and questions um, from some of our co-hosts. And then if you want to stick around, uh, Mikado, I think we'll have an additional panel after the final pitch as well. Yeah, I just want to uh, welcome Makoto too. Hi, thanks for coming and uh, I appreciate your time today. I know it's quite late where you are. Uh, it'd be great just to kind of do a brief intro about yourself and then go into the project. I, I don't know if you've got anything specifically um, planned, but you know, entirely up to you. But um, yeah, I think we'd, we'd love to hear your kind of opinions and views around um, you know, incubators, projects. You know, it, it, there's a lot of entrepreneurs here looking to you know, really kind of bring their passions to life. and. Uh, you know, you're a perfect example of somebody who's done that and successfully. So I'm sure that everybody here would be would be really interested in your, your opinion there. So anyway, um, I think we're live, guys. So over to you guys. Okay, so should I start with just an introduction or do you have yeah, something? Yeah, start, start with an introduction and then if you want to share your screen and we can get into the presentation. Okay, cool. I'll just do a brief, short uh, self-introduction, then I have some slides so I can kind of uh, ground the explanation. Uh, so my name is Makoto Takemiya. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sorimitsu, uh, which is a Japanese uh, fintech uh, company that specializes in blockchain. We've been around um, almost five years now, uh, and we've done a lot of work in the enterprise uh, blockchain space, um, in addition to the open uh, uh, public blockchain uh, space as well. So uh, what I'll talk about mainly today is our work in the public space, which is uh, Sora and Focuswap. But uh, we've also done quite a lot in enterprise work. So we built a, a central bank digital currency system in Cambodia that's in use by the central bank, uh, Project Bakon. And uh, we've done quite a lot of other uh, similar payment systems and uh, things like that. Um, yeah, today I'll talk about uh, Sora and uh, Pokeswap, but mainly Pokeswap because I think that's kind of interesting to the uh, to the people here. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, you should be able to see some slides. Is that okay? Yep. Yeah, I see it. Cool. So, so Pokeswap. Uh, before I get into it, is uh, is an application. It's a Dex that's being built on top of a network uh, called the Sora network, and. Sora is a decentralized economic system. Uh, the basic, uh, really short explanation of what that is, is it's a way to, um, to mint new tokens and then allocate them for productive uses. So uh, more traditional cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin uh, have some inflationary model, uh, but they don't actually give uh, the newly minted Bitcoins to people who to build uh, new things, but they give it to miners. and. Um, from macroeconomic theory, that's not really a, a very good use of, new, of newly minted uh, purchasing power. Instead, it's better to create new tokens and give it to people to uh, to create new goods and services um, as well. So in Sora, we have a way uh, that the token uh, supply is managed by token bonding curve, but a portion of the, <clears throat> of the margin of the token bonding curve um, is actually allocatable uh, to producers. So it's kind of like a decentralized um, I mean, a crude way of putting it would be like a decentralized investment fund. It's not really an investment fund uh, per se, but, uh, but it is a way to kind of uh, mint new tokens and allocate it uh, to those who can create new goods and services that expand the, the economic uh, sphere of influence of the, um, of the XOR uh, token. Um, so that's the basic network. And on top of this network, uh, we're building, uh, well, there's a, quite a few applications being built, but one of them is called Pokeswap. And this is a DEX uh, that's kind of made uh, for the, the multi-chain uh, Polkadot universe. Um, and we got a grant uh, back in, uh, I guess it's March or April uh, from Web3 Foundation to build this. And we've been working on it ever since. And uh, uh, first MVP release uh, is probably gonna be in January. Um, PokeSwap, just to put it really, uh, simply is, is a automatic market making constant product DEX, uh, similar to Uniswap. Um, you have uh, you have liquidity pools, and then you, all the uh, trades are executed against these liquidity pools. Um, that's the the base uh, uh, MVP that we're building. In the future, we plan to expand this some more to have things like order books and things like that. But um, but at the beginning, it'll be pretty simple. Um, we have some pretty unique uh, liquidity aggregation uh, technology where we don't actually care about uh, the source of the liquidity. It doesn't have to be. On the PokeSwap DEX, it could be another DEX, it could be on Uniswap, it could be a centralized exchange. It doesn't really matter. 
Um, so the pathfinding algorithm uh, for, for trade matching will actually try to source the liquidity from the best source, uh, regardless of, uh, of even what blockchain it'll be. That being said, there, there are significant costs and uh, uh, time uh, trade-offs with you know, executing trades uh, on a non-Polkadot chain like uh, Ethereum, uh, because Ethereum doesn't really have uh, transaction finality like Polkadot has. Um, so that's, uh, that's a brief summary. Um, so why are we building this? I think it's pretty simple. Uh, DEXs are very interesting. They're innovative. They're part of the decomposable DeFi uh, experience, but uh, the current infrastructure is not so good from a user standpoint. Uh, gas fees are very high. They're kind of unpredictable um, and uh, networks very susceptible to congestion and, and slowing down. Um, also, uh, current DEXs, uh, I, I would say, have inefficient uh, liquidity. So liquidity is fragmented across too many pairs. So instead of having um, like a hub uh, currency or pair, uh, everything is kind of like, you know, you can have many different uh, pairwise uh, combinations of, of, uh, of tokens. And uh, this fragments liquidity too much, uh, causing more price slippage. Um, also, current DEX design has a lot of uh, impermanent loss uh, uh, and ri other risks uh, for liquidity providers, um, and so it's better to, uh, to to try to solve some of these issues. So, um, so with PokerSwap, we're actually we have a few. So in many of the cases, it's very similar to Uniswap, uh, but we we actually have a lot of core innovations that we've developed uh, that that make it you know better in important ways. Um, <clears throat> so we we use a uh, substrate uh, as the well, the Sora network uses substrate, and so we're able to get a pretty reliable uh, block times uh, with transaction finality of around six seconds, um, with very low um, transaction gas fees. In fact, on the Sora network, we're planning to have a flat rate uh, for transactions, so that all transactions are very um, smooth and predictable cost. You don't have to worry about, you know, what is the current congestion level. Um, for developers, this is great because you don't have to, you know, call the F gas station or some uh, similar analog on the polka, polka dot ecosystem in order to find out, um, you know, what the transaction fee should be. Um, our uh, our liquidity uh, aggregation technology, as I as I talked about a little bit, it, it allows us to uh, to unify uh, liquidity across many different sources, and this can give a lower price slippage uh, when executing, um, especially large uh, orders. Um, and uh, we, we've done quite a lot of work on the tokenomics. So the way we design the XOR token and uh, and, and our reward token PSwap um, makes it uh, a little bit less risk for liquidity providers. So um, yeah, I think I have time. So I'll, I'll talk specifically like what, what these innovations are uh, in a little bit. Um, but before that, I think it might be important to understand what the PSwap token is and uh, why, why it's uh, used to reward liquidity providers. Uh, PSwap token is a unique, um, it's a unique model because it's not, it's a reward token, but it's deflationary. So most uh, reward tokens are inflationary. It's always easier to mint uh, tokens than to, you know, to create some tokenomics for deminting. Um, but what we do is we take 0.3% of every transaction uh, amount, amount, and uh, this is used to, to do market buy of uh, PSwap tokens. And then these bot tokens uh, are just burned. So this is done by the smart contract. So this is actually executed uh, at each transaction. So it's constant, uh, uh, you know, buy pressure on a PSwap token. And uh, the way the reward works is uh, liquidity providers get a fraction of the burned amount uh, every day. So all day long, uh, PSwap tokens are burned, and every night, once once per twenty four hours, um, PSwap tokens a portion of the burned amount is reminted and then given to the liquidity providers, um, you know, pro rata based on you know how much um, liquidity they're they're giving. Uh, an example shown on this graph on the right. Um, there's a there's the, I, I'm kind of skipping over a lot of the details, but there's a parliament uh, called the Sword Parliament that is providing some decentralized governance. Uh, this parliament is getting 10% of the tokens to uh, to help fund future development. Um, 10% of the burned amount, but then uh, the rest is uh, is going to liquidity providers, or um, you can see that later on, you, you also have a strategic bonus uh, vesting as well. Um, so just as an example, uh, if uh, 10,000 PSwap tokens are burned during a day and the reward amounts is 80%, then 8,000 tokens are 
reminted and given to the uh, the goodie providers, and then one thousand would be given to the um, the sort of parliament uh, in that example. Um, so th that's that's the basic model. So the the cool thing about this token is it's uh, uh, it's 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 used to give to liquidity providers rather than uh, just giving liquidity providers more share in the same liquidity pool that they, they give. Because if you give the same uh, liquidity pool tokens to, to, to liquidity providers, it's a correlated risk. And by uh, minting an entirely new token that's potentially uncorrelated, uh, it, it helps uh, reduce risk a little bit. Um, also, the token is deflationary, so this helps incentivize longer term uh, actors than, uh, than people who just want to um, you know, to exit quickly. Um, I'll kind of skip the token distribution, but generally I'll just say that we're trying to aim towards something like a fair launch. So there's a, there's a, uh, the total supply will be hundred million, but we won't ever, you know, see this uh, at all uh, floating around at once because uh, at the beginning, only around 25% will be um, distributed. So 20% to team and then maybe some airdrops. And we're doing a farming game right now um, for, for farming these tokens. Uh, by providing liquidity and Uniswap. This is kind of a test of our uh, incentive mechanism for liquidity provision. Um, and uh, as you can see on the chart, there's uh, something called liquidity rewards and uh, parent chain incentives. So these are, um, we have to get a parent chain in the Polkadot ecosystem. So some of the token supply is used for that. And then most of the, of the remaining tokens are used for liquidity uh, provision uh, rewards. So special reward on, that goes above and beyond the transaction fees. We actually want to, to get people to come and add lots of liquidity. Um, I think everyone knows Polkadot is, has a lot of potential for growth. It's quite a compelling and interesting um, vision. So I'll kind of skip over that. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the ways that we reduce the risk to liquidity providers, because I think this is a very key um, point. And we've done a lot of research in this uh, field. So um, one of the key things is we use XOR, uh, which is the SOAR, to SOAR token, the SOAR network token, um, as the liquidity pool token. So what this means is that every, um, every token pair that you give uh, liquidity to on the DEX has to be re with respect to XOR. It's kind of like Uniswap V1, where everything was with uh, respect to ETH. Um, but uh, XOR is a very unique token because the way we designed it, it uses a token bonding curve uh, to manage the supply. Um, this may, uh, what this means is somebody puts in a reserve currency, like uh, let's say ETH or DOT, and then you mint new tokens from this. And then if you want to sell back, you put ETH or DOT back into the token bonding curve contract and you get, uh, you demint uh, the XOR and you, or, sorry, you put XOR back into the contract and then you get back your, your DOT or ETH or whatever. So it's, it's a contract that holds reserves. So XOR is a derivative currency. It's based, it's backed by a uh, multi-collateral. So it actually has some you know, value basis and, and this provides price, uh, not price stability per se, but I would say predictability because you, you have some known reserves and you know what the current buy price and sell price is because these are quoted um, by the smart contract. Um, and uh, so this, this makes it more stable with respect to fiat and this, that helps uh, reduce, uh, reduce impermanent loss. And then also by, uh, by having a token binding curve contract that can manage the supply elastically, uh, it's, it's very liquid currency. If you want to buy a trillion dollars, you can do it. You know, in, in one command, because it'll happily just mint uh, new supply for you. Um, I already talked about uh, PSwap rewards, but that's a very key point that it's not a correlated risk. Um, uh, we're working on some cool uh, technology called uh, liquidity leveraging. So, um, because uh, so we, in our token binding curve for XOR, we have different reserve currencies. So, if you provide liquidity using XOR and one of the reserve currencies. Um, you're actually able to use your liquidity pool um, as collateral to uh, to mint uh, more XOR, um, like maybe not a full amount, but maybe half half of what the value is. Uh, and this this actually lets you um, potentially you know add even more liquidity on PokerSwap. Uh, and I talked about liquidity ag aggregation already. Um, on the right hand side, you can see kind of a schematic overview of the network. So it's a cross chain, um, you know, DEX by by nature. Um, so we're, we have different price circles and things like that. We also use uh, 
uh, connect to the rest of the Polkadot ecosystem via a parachain. And then we have direct bridges to some blockchains like um, Ethereum and, uh, and uh, Bitcoin. But we're starting with Ethereum because there's lots of assets and it's a, it's a big need. Um, I will maybe just kind of end uh, talking a little bit about uh, the team and then I'm happy to you know, have a discussion. But uh, I talked about a little bit about myself. I'm a computer scientist by training. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, our team, I think, has done a lot of very interesting work working with, um, you know, even the central bank and, and uh, uh, we did some work with Moscow Exchange Group as well. Um, so we've done quite a lot of interesting things. We've actually been working with uh, Web3 Foundation since 2018. Uh, we created uh, Kagome, which is a C++ version of Polkadot. And uh, we've also been working with Protocol Labs on uh, uh, a C++ version of Filecoin. Um, and we also created the C++ version of libp uh, 2 p So we've done, done, done a lot of things <laughs> as a company. We're about uh, 90 people now and uh, most mostly uh, engineers. So um, <laughs> that's a very uh, brief overview of what we're doing. Um, so hopefully it's interesting. I didn't even talk about like the, val uh, the validator reward token or anything like that on Sora Network, but we have lo lots of other stuff <laughs> as well. Um, oh, and I'll just kind of end uh, by saying that uh, we also created a, a wallet um, for uh, the Polkadot ecosystem called Fearless Wallet. Uh, so it's it just was launched uh, last week, actually. So. I really encourage people to check that out. It's very, um, it's 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 the only uh, Polkadot uh, ecosystem mobile wallet that uh, is built natively. So we we did the native uh, Android and iOS uh, app uh, development rather than just using cross compiling tools like other projects have done. And this gives higher performance and I would say higher security as well. Um, anyway, that's uh, <laughs> that's a brief overview. I'm happy to answer any any questions. Sure. No, we really appreciate that presentation. Um, if you want, you can stop sharing your screen. We can go to uh, portrait mode now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I have a couple questions jotted down and I want to pass it out to everyone else. Um, so if Uni had a, this is kind of a, a higher level question, but if Uni decided to launch uh, an AMM, they're obviously on, coming up on V3, but if they decided to, to launch an AMM that was a competitor to to poker swat um obviously you have a lot of collaboration with them right now through the liquidity mining program that you were speaking about which i have a follow-up question on as well uh but but how would you handle that in in terms of their brand recognition and, and notoriety at the moment uh where, where do you maybe differentiate yourself in that in that pivot and and how can you keep your unique uh, product offering uh valuable to people who are who are on the network yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, Uniswap is very highly funded. They have a good brand, good team, lots of users. So um, yeah, they would be very, uh, I, I guess, very strong competition if they did come into the Polkadot ecosystem, um, which uh, which I wouldn't be surprised if they did at some point. I know that other uh, exchanges uh, from Ethereum are looking at that. Um, I think the main, uh, the main, I guess, secret weapons that we would have would be the uh, the technology that we've developed, and then also the fearless wallet. Because uh, by having a, a, a wallet interface that uh, directly plugs into a Polka Swap, it does give us a slight advantage over other um, uh, competing applications in the in the space. Uh, that being said, there's quite a lot of other competitors in the space. Uh, Dex space is very crowded uh, in general, but um, I think uh, by you know, building a high quality product and high quality user interface uh, that's actually native to um, to the Polkadot ecosystem, I think we can, you know, create a compelling tool that other people can use. Um, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's a brief answer. But I, I do think that some of the tokenomics that we have, especially built around the XOR token, um, probably give us an advantage that it'd be hard for other projects to have. Um, uh, though, of course, Uniswap has, you know, many users and they'd be very, uh, a compelling com competitor, I would say. Yeah, I think that's a good segue to my next question in terms of uh, in terms of UI and usability and low friction. So there's a lot of hopium out there, maybe from the decentralized community, that uh, centralized exchanges will become irrelevant due to products like yourself. Uh, but even you know, even through usability uh, with simple and 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 fr uh, frictionless uh, UI components such as Uniswap and and now PokaSwap. Uh, we still lack basic trading tools. There's a lot of 
kind of L2 solutions, I think Unilayer is coming out with and, and, and others, uh, you know, how do we, uh, with, it's kind of like this trade-off that's going on between AMMs and sexes at the moment, uh, with clear value coming from the AMM side, uh, how do we pivot from, you know, being kind of the early launch pad uh, for different projects to more of a mainstream uh, solution for retail users? Yeah, well, there's definitely a lot of downsides to AMMs. Uh, the capital um, efficiency is not very high because you do have to lock up huge amounts of tokens uh, in liquidity pools. Um, so I do think that uh, having more, you know, centralized exchange style features, things like uh, maybe futures, options, um, trading, and also uh, order book would be uh, definitely needed. Also leverage, of course. Um, yeah, these these are things that I think are going to be coming to DEXs in the, in the near future. Um, I think the main use case going forward for, for sexes would be not day-to-day um, -day like shitcoin trading, but rather um, fiat on ramps, on ramps, uh, and off ramps, uh, so that people can, um, you know, kind of get in and out of the uh, legacy financial system. Uh, that being said, I mean, regulation is coming even to DeFi. Uh, so um, it'll be interesting to see how this is going to happen. Um, uh, already, we, we uh, have been trying to kind of be forward thinking in, in the way that we structure things so that all the software we write is actually uh, released in a disabled form and then the community has to either enable it uh, you know by uh, doing some voting and uh, inserting cryptographic proof of the voting um, into the smart contracts and things like that so we just experimented with this um, in the release of our val token last month uh, on the SOAR network and uh, uh, I think that's going to be one one way to kind of uh, deal with the, the regulation in more of a decentralized way um, but yeah, I think uh, I think sex is. I, it's been uh, quite a while since. So I only use sexes nowadays to um, uh, trade tokens that are, are like maybe not on Ethereum, like anything on Ethereum, like any ERC twenty token. Uh, typically nowadays has uh, anything. I, I, uh, any major major interesting project has enough liquidity now on Uniswap, so it's not really um, an issue. And uh, and tools like One Inch are, are, are fantastic for. Um, you know, executing trades on multiple uh, uh, multiple liquidity sources at once. Yeah, so I, I guess there's two questions that I had branching off of that as well. Uh, in your presentation, you said that you had the ability to, to swap with Bitcoin. Uh, kind of a two-part question. Number one is, is the Bitcoin you spoke about a wrapper Bitcoin? And do you believe that wrap Bitcoin on Ethereum is the next revolution in terms of Bitcoin adoption? Um, well, I think wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum has gained a lot of traction. It's uh, I, I know a lot of people who are, are using it a lot more. Um, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that every bridge has some component of trust uh, just by the, the, the nature, uh, especially for Bitcoin until there's uh, Schnorr signatures. Um, it's a little bit um, harder to build bridges for this. That being said, there's very good protocols like Xclaim and the protocol we do is similar to that. Um, where basically we use a federation of uh, validators on the network that already exists and are validating and they uh, help maintain the uh, the bridge. Um, so that's that's the way we do it. It's, it's, it's a two-way peg uh, style system where we, um, you know, lock the Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network and then we uh, mint uh, new tokens that, you know, are pegged to that Bitcoin on our network. And then you can, of course, undo this operation. Um, there's, a physical, it, there's a physical aspect going on with that locked contract. Well, the yeah, yeah it's, but it's being done by a federation of notaries, and so uh, it's it has the same security as the um, as the network has, um, and that's that's about as good as you can get. That's that's what uh, Interlay is also doing for Polka BTC, um, and uh, I think that's it's it's good enough uh, for now. You don't want to have any any centralized, you know, like team of uh, people with the multi sig or something like that. Um, um, which I've seen, I've seen some projects like that, believe it or not. Um, uh, so I, I think Bitcoin has uh, the Bitcoin. So Bitcoin's very interesting because it's got a lot of hype and, and a lot of maybe traction. Um, it's it's interesting as a store of value because it it uh, it, it the the price has been trending upwards uh, over time. It, we don't know if that's all, always going to be the case. The economics, as I alluded to, are not very good because that's that's why we created Sora in the first place. 
Um, but the Bitcoin network transacting actually on the network is a terrible user experience. So it's, you know, you transact and you wait maybe 10 minutes, maybe half an hour. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's much better to use something like uh, Ethereum, which is still not that fast, but on, on Polkadot style systems and on the Sora network version two, you're going to have six second finality, which is a very, very nice, uh, you know, transaction fee. It's like sending an instant message or something. So you don't have to, mm -hmm. you don't have to deal with all this nonsense anymore about, oh, there's, there's not enough, I don't know, maybe there's a new crypto kitty or something you can't transact for eight hours. Um, so uh, fortunately the technology has evolved to the point that that's not really a problem anymore. Gotcha. So we have about five minutes left. And like I said, I, I still have some additional questions for the panel section, uh, but I kind of wanted to wrap up the next five minutes uh, well, we'll start with this question and see how much time we have. So you spoke about regulatory landscape and, and centralized exchanges to, to a degree. Um, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a professional legal advisor, uh, but most of the legal advisors that I speak with, you know, they typically advise projects to go through Reg D regulation. Um, most of them don't really have to file Reg D. They just need to follow Reg D. And part of Reg D is that Number one, you're not promoting to, to U.S. citizens on U.S. platforms. That's a little vague and typically thrown out. But the more direct one is that you're not launching on a U.S.-facing exchange. And a lot of people are worried about, uh, even though Uni is not custodial, they do have some incentive in, in terms of the liquidity mining program that goes to the team. They own 25% of that token, I believe, 20%. Um, and there's a, almost a smoking gun that links projects uh, directly to Uniswap in terms of the liquidity, uh, the liquidity addition uh, when, when they launch. And that seems to be the, the major use case that's really fueling a lot of this Uniswap adoption to get to a point where we can look at it from, uh, from a more broad general exchange. So obviously a lot of the security um, issues fall on the projects themselves, but where do you see from a regular, regulatory perspective AMMs falling within that narrative? And how does um, how does Pokeswap differentiate itself uh, in terms of lowering the liability risk from a regulatory perspective? <laughs> so yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it's quite uh, I think uh, it, it's also I think very difficult to answer. Um, generally, the the main dogma is that um, you know this is a, a contract that's executed on chain, and so you don't even have to go to the Uniswap website per se. You could just you know if you knew what you were doing, you could write some code and and just execute things directly uh, on the Ethereum. And for for PokerSwap, it's more or less the same thing. And we're also putting a lot of investment, same as Uniswap has done, into using IPFS uh, for web hosting, so that even the uh, the web client is as decentralized as possible. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think the only answer to the regulation really is to um, is to not uh, actually be the ones launching things. So even for PokerSwap, we're writing code uh, and putting it out there, and then um, it has to be enabled by the community. It can't be it just it can't just be released by us. In a, on the Substrate uh, Polkadot ecosystem, this can be done by voting. There's a voting pallet uh, and. Uh, uh, there's, you can you can uh, have like a PokerSwap uh, deliverable that is then put out uh, on the network, and it, but it, it it can't be used until it's it's enabled. So people with the tokens have to vote and enable the system, and and that's the only way it becomes enabled. And as long as the the team doesn't own a majority of the tokens, and uh, so they don't control it themselves, I think it can be argued, and I've talked to, to lawyers about this as well, that um, you you can kind of argue that we're just uh, uh, you know, using our uh, freedom of speech to write code and uh, we're putting this code out there and we're not actually the ones deploying it because it's being, it's being done by the community and, and we're not running the servers either because it's done by, um, you know, on a decentralized world um, infrastructure. Um, okay. Uniswap is interesting because a lot of the team, I think, actually is in the U.S. Um, and um, I think the biggest risk for Uniswap would be probably from a Securities and Exchange Commission, where um, you know it could be seen as unlicensed um, securities exchange, um, or they, and even if it's decentralized, like you said, if the team has uh, a lot of the tokens, it, it could be, you know, it's a little bit uh, sketchy uh, in some ways. But uh, there's no legal precedent yet, and we're still trying to see, you know, where this is going to go. Um, I do know that. Uh, oh, Okay. Yeah. 
No, I was oh. going to say, maybe we can follow up with that a little bit more in the panel section. Um, cause I do want to keep us on, on, on track in terms of time. Uh, I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, I'd love to have amazing projects like yourself, uh, on, on board to, you know, support the ideation of, uh, the projects that are pitching today, uh, and the other presentations that have gone on throughout the week, uh, to culminate, uh, this event, uh, we're thinking we're getting some feedback from Dubai, but, um, yeah, so let's, let's table this just for about 40 minutes. Uh, we're going to head there's, over to our, yeah, go ahead. There's a, there's a question. Whenever you get a feedback, uh, I think that's a sign that we, we have got something to say about something. I, I actually have one more question. Can we get is, them? Is, okay. Out of, out of all the, out of all the infrastructures that are out there, how did you guys end up choosing Polkadot and why Polkadot? I mean, Ethereum, obviously, why not? But when you look at the whole broad, the whole wide playing field, if you want to call it, why Polkadot? Uh, is it okay to answer, Maddie? Uh, do we have time? Or? He's the boss here, so we're going to keep going. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If G says we're if G says we're extending, we're extending. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> hey, I didn't knew we were really losing time. I'm sorry about that. Really sorry. No, no worries, no worries. We have we have some extra time in the panel as well. So let's an, let's answer uh, let's answer the question uh, and and prioritize that. Yeah, I'll just super be, curious, really. Okay. Yeah, I'll just be really fast in answering. So the uh, we we chose Polkadot ecosystem mainly because uh, it does seem more scalable um, than Ethereum. Um, and uh, from a technological side, and then also uh, uh, the way that code is written in Rust using Palettes and also Parity Inc. Uh, smart contracts is much easier to develop than Solidity code in EVM. Uh, <laughs> and the, sure. and the, yeah, and the design is much more um, efficient than the EVM. And then, um, and then the other part of that would be that I, I do think Polkadot ecosystem can evolve faster because uh, you have many different people each each having their own chain, and uh, because you can upgrade the runtimes of each chain independently, um, you can experiment with things a lot more. In, in Ethereum, uh, if you wanted to, you know, create a new consensus algorithm, you know, it'll take you 10 years to talk to miners and, and, and uh, push it out. Uh, but in, in Polkadot, you can just do it. So I think um, for, as an engineer, I like that uh, philosophy better. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask, uh, but I don't think we have the time now, but uh, from my days working uh, at Linux IT, uh, what was exciting for me most of the time is actually spending some time with the, the tech, uh, the dev teams, uh, who usually don't really like to be around um, kind of more commercial people. But for me, I started looking at um, poker, poker, poker dot in particular because around 18 months, 12 months, 12 to 18 months ago, there was so much um, chat in the dev community. And for me, that's what really, you know, kind of piqued my interest. You know, if we're looking in kind of cutting edge new technologies, you know, you always want to find out really what the dev community is thinking and talking about. And so I think uh, that kind of drew my attention immediately. I know me and Matt have been talk talking about Polkadot in particular for a long time. And we have this, you know, juggernaut of a, Ethereum kind of, um, if you like, uh, ecosystem that, you know, has historically had the most community devs and, and, you know, kind of real interaction in that space. And I'm super excited to, to, to see what Polkadot really does provide. And uh, I'm pretty sure that we'll be talking about them and Ethereum as being kind of the two main juggernauts of the future, in my, in my opinion. So, so thank you very much, Makoto. I think we're going to go onto a new stream uh, now for the next uh, pitch. Uh, we're really, really grateful to have, I think three team members here from uh, Spherium Finance. Um, so guys, if you just bear with us, we're just about to um,